Welcome to The Art of Discernment, a podcast where professors from across the Master's University discuss current events and higher education from a biblical worldview. Hello, this is Dr. Bob Dixon, and with me today is a very special guest. I have Dr. Matt McLean, Associate Professor of Biology and Geology here at the Master's University. Matt, welcome. Hey, thanks. Thanks for having me. And Dr. McLean has joined us because, well... There's been an interesting scientific discovery that we really need to get his take on because it's just so fascinating. It deals with, and we'll we'll talk about what this thing actually is in a moment, but it's called a lamprey and what it means for science, specifically evolutionary science. So without further ado, let's get into it. Sure. Yeah. So, um, I mean, I think to really understand this discovery, we've got some some context we got to put in there, right? Please, <laughs> please. Lampreys are not things that a lot of people sit around thinking about. Um, and uh, so if you're unfamiliar with a lamprey at all, um, this is, it's a fish, um, but it's not a typical kind of fish because it has no jaws. So it basically just has like a big hole for a mouth. Um, and most of them have like a suction mouth. And what they do, the majority of them as adults will go and like attach themselves to a fish and um, be parasitic. They'll suck out its blood, which is really nasty. Um, and, uh, so there's only like, I think it's like 39 or so living species of lampreys. There's not that many out there. Um, and most of them, well, all of them go through fresh water at some point and many of them switch between that and their lifestyle. And so they'll live in the ocean. Many of them, they'll go into fresh water, lay their eggs, and then the eggs hatch into a baby that looks very different than the adult. Um, and the babies, we call them amocetes. Um, and they, they're just very different looking. They don't have the sucker mouth. Um, they're filter feeding. So they're just taking in, um, stuff in the water column and, and, uh, pushing it through there and eating it that way. Um, and they look kind of primitive is kind of the idea. So, um, in the evolutionary model, ever since the 1800s, people have looked at amocetes and they've said, Hey, this looks like the ancestor for all of our vertebrates, all of our animals with bones, right? whether it's a mammal or a fish or a reptile. Um, and so, like I said, ever since the 1800s, people in, in classrooms and in you know medical schools and scientists have just used these little baby lampreys as evidence for um, what our ancestors should look like is kind of the argument. And so the argument goes like, hey, because lampreys go through this phase where they have a baby that looks like our ancestor, therefore... You know, um, Hmm. we are seeing our ancestor in these things, like a a mimic of our ancestor is kind of the idea. Um, And so this paper was just published this year, um, and they were looking at fossils of a stem lamprey. So very close to a lamprey, but they're uh, from the Devonian. So they're um, in the conventional model. You're talking about something that's, you know, between 300, 400 million years old. Um, They are um, the the. One they're looking at, it's called Priscomyzon, um, and it is from South Africa. And we had known about this animal for a while, but it turns out that when they went and looked more closely, they found that they were baby ones, versions of it. And so they have a whole growth series from an adult all the way down to, they think, even one that just hatched that still has a yolk sac on it. So that's pretty cool to have that in the fossil oh, yeah. record because, you know, these animals don't have bones. So, like, they're they're not going to preserve that well. Um, So that's cool to have that. But what was really exciting for these um, researchers is they found the babies all the way up to the adult, none of them ever are amocetes. They're never these traditional lamprey larvae. They're always, they just kind of look like a smaller version of the adult with some few changes in them. Um, And so this was really shocking, right? (laughs) Because you're you're expecting if, if the amocete is supposed to look like our ancestor, it should be back here, you know, like however 300, 400 million years ago. Um, and it's not. In fact, the the fossil lampreys of the Devonian, they're basically, their babies just look like smaller versions of the adults. And so they went, they said, okay, well, we got to look at some other fossil lampreys, right? So they went to the stuff that in other layers um, throughout the Paleozoic. And what they found was consistently, none of these guys have baby versions that are amocetes. They're all look like baby adult versions, essentially. Um, and so they said, well, I guess that means that Lampreys having this baby that looks like an ancestor, it's unrelated to the ancestor, in fact. And so that that overturns some thinking. I'm I'm looking at the there's a there's an article that's based on the paper. Yeah. And the article written by one of the researchers in of the paper, 
and the, and the article the headline is revealing. It says fossil lamprey larvae from South Africa overturn assumptions about vertebrae origins. So translate that for us. And what yeah. what what does that mean? <laughs> sure. So um, so like I was saying, the um, the traditional thinking was a baby lamprey and amacid, you know, the modern ones that looks like our ancestor, right? And so we can use that as the template for what the vertebrate ancestor was like. And so, and you know, if you took a comparative anatomy class or any kind of, you know, vertebrate paleontology class in a school, you were taught this. This is just, you know, fact. Even when I was teaching vert paleo um, a few weeks ago, we talked about lampreys and I said, hey, baby lampreys look a lot like what the vertebrate ancestor is supposed to be. I don't know what that means, but that's what you see, right? And so we had a little discussion about that. And that was before this paper came out. And so now... Suddenly, if you read the, you know, especially like you're talking about the the popular article about this this paper, um, you know, they said, well, um, I guess that means that this is a completely novel thing these lampreys did. That for whatever reason, during their evolution, they switched to having babies that metamorphose and, and originally look like a primitive thing, but actually aren't. Um, and so they said, we need to stop looking at the ammo seat as the vertebrate ancestor, a template for it. And instead, we need to be looking at things deep in the fossil record that we haven't been considering in the past. And so that completely overturns the way this has been taught for many, many years. So when you say 300 million years, and what, what does that mean from our perspective as, as Bible-believing young earth Christians? Yeah, yeah. So, um, I mean, that's that's really the challenge of geology, right? And creation geology. So um, you know, we, we are very convinced from the word of God that the earth is young. You know, we're talking on the order of thousands of years as opposed to, you know, these hundreds of millions of years that they're dealing with. So, um, you know, the animals we're talking about today, they're fossils. We typically think these are ones deposited by the flood. Um, and so this would be happening during that year long event, um, with, with Noah and the ark and everything. Um, and then there would be fossils deposited afterwards. And so, the, the hundreds of millions of years that are there really, like I said, end up being just thousands of years. When you've got, for, for example, when, when I talk with my friends who aren't Christians and the, the subject of evolu- evolution often comes up when you're, when you're getting into to conversations about origins of the universe and the, and the creator and what you yeah. always do, that, that's always a sticking point or often a sticking point. Um, and what I what I hear a lot is, well, science and the Bible, they're they're not congruent. They're mm-hmm. they're opposed. Uh, talk a bit about about how something like this reinforces what you and I believe about science and the Bible. Yeah, I, I think um, you know that's really where I would go with this, right? Um, so I was excited about this article because um, many times the way these things are portrayed. In, in science, right? You, t- you sit in a typical science classroom or you, you, know, you watch a documentary or something and it's like, this is such obvious evidence for evolution. I mean, there's, there's no other way you could interpret this, mm. right? That's the way it's presented. So, hey, a baby lamprey looks like an ancestor, right? There's, there's this idea in evolution called ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny, okay? And the idea is <laughs> okay. as you grow as an individual, right? Yeah. From an embryo to an adult, you mimic your evolutionary history. Okay, so, um, you know, and this was back in the days to talk about embryos with like human embryos going through like a fish stage and a reptile stage. And, you know, that's not really true anymore, but there's certainly are still some similarities with those animals. And so the evolutionist looks at it and says, look, th- there's literally no other way you could explain this. Right. Um, right. Why, why else would this exist? And, um, you know, so we have these discussions in the classroom and, and um, you know, it, it can be challenging for people that they can look at that and they can say, man, I don't know how else to interpret that. And, you know, what I tell creationists when they encounter these kinds of problems is just always, hey, look, be patient, right? Because I've seen enough of how claims in science have gone to realize that there's very often another side to these things. Mm-hmm. And further discoveries tend to illuminate our understanding and make us realize that, oops, we made mistakes before. And so what a lot of people don't realize about science in general, um, and this is just from, you know, poor teaching or the media, whatever, um, people think that like science is like this concrete, like once we discover something, it's done. Like that's known, it's a fact, you just move on to the next thing, right? But that's that's not how science works. You know, if you went to school in, you know, let's say 300 AD, right, in, in ancient, um, you know, Rome, 
um, you would be taught that everything, you know, all the stars, all the planets, the sun, the moon, they all go around the earth, right? Right. And the earth doesn't move. And that would be fact. And that was fact for generations. And nowadays you go to school and you're taught, no, actually the earth moves around the sun, right? And the moon goes around the earth and it's all this kind of stuff. And um, science changes. And so things that we consider to be concrete facts can really be, um, in fact, wrong later on. And so as I'm approaching somebody who's, you know, saying, well, all, you know, I trust in science for these things. It's like, well, listen, science is an ever-changing field. And if that's your foundation, you've got to realize you've got to keep updating that foundation mm, all the right. time. So the, what you're saying is the phrase that we hear often nowadays, the science is settled, right. is an oxymoron. Yes. I mean, you know, it's in not a like, general sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not like I'm going to go out tomorrow and like disprove gravity, you know, like, like that's not <laughs> right. going to happen. But, but we need to realize that, um, you know, so, you know, people like to pit the Bible against science, like you're saying, or God mm. against science, you know, and, and I'll even hear like some old earth creationists or theistic evolutionists, they'll use the argument of, you know, um, the, the nature is the second book of God, right? The Bible is the first book, nature is the second book, and they can't disagree. And so because nature says this, you know, then we need to believe that, right? But what people are getting confused on is science is a human endeavor, right? Nature is nature. I agree 100%. Like God made that. It is what it is, right? But science is our attempt to understand nature. Mm. And that doesn't mean we're always going to get it right. You know, so I, I remember being in a class at Cedarville one time and um, the the teacher was talking about general revelation, right? And a student said, well, you know, if, if people can look at nature and know there's a God, then how can there be so many atheists in the sciences? You know, how can so many people get that wrong? And the teacher just said, well, do you know anyone who's ever read the Bible and come to the wrong conclusion? And you're like, <laughs> oh, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. Once it's we a start great thinking answer. about it, yeah. <laughs> you know, we, we forget that science is a human attempt to understand what God has made. And so we're going to get stuff wrong, right? And so um, our foundation to correctly interpret nature, we need the word of God. Um, to help us understand it, because otherwise we are going to come to wrong conclusions. And even then when we do science, yeah, we're still going to get stuff wrong, but at least we've got that foundation. Whereas if you're just saying science is my perspective, you know, science is my worldview, that's it, that's my foundation. Well, it's a constantly shifting foundation. Um, it's it's really like building your house on sand. I remember uh, as, a, as a young Christian, and I don't know who to attribute this to, but hearing an illustration that uh, the the scientists and the and the f great philosophers in history, they they and the deep thinkers of of history, human history, you know, ascend finally the the the, t the pinnacle, the zenith of the mountain of knowledge, and they get to the very top, and there are the theologians sitting around a table saying, "What took you so long to get here?" <laughs> and I and this is a good example of that. I, I think of that again that you know, we we look at we look at science as, okay, where, where does it fit in with what we know to be true based on what scripture tells us mm -hmm. uh, versus we look at, looking at science saying, oh, where does it, where, where do we not understand? And assuming, well, then scripture is wrong, but I, I right. love your answer. No, be patient, yes. be patient. We don't, we don't have full knowledge and understanding and, and the science is always new. It's always yeah. coming. It's always happening. So now I, I, I learned later uh, after I got out of high school, oh, half of the stuff I read in the textbooks was actually wrong and <laughs> had been disproven for quite a while, right. but still remained in the textbooks. And I, and I hear a lot of that stuff still in the textbooks. So this study that that's in our hands about the, I'm going to try to pronounce it too. The non amocete, no, non amocete yeah. larvae of paleozoic stem lampreys. Did I get it right? Yes. Cause I was practicing that. That's good. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> uh, will, will this, the, the fruit of this paper, will it, will it change textbooks? I think eventually. So, I mean, it'll it'll start with, um, you know, like a lot of your college and, and grad level, you know, textbooks. Those will change very, you know, rapidly for that. But um, high school textbooks, I don't know. I mean, maybe never. Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, um, this isn't the first time we've run into something like this, right? So, I mean, the example I used to use in class all the time, now I can use this one too, but you think about frogs, right? Frogs go through a tadpole stage. You know, they mm -hmm. hatch out an egg, they little tadpole, they grow legs, you know, they come out. I mean, that looks a lot like fish evolving into four-legged animals, mm -hmm. right? And yep. so for a long time, that's how people thought about, hey, this is like proof of that. Well, then once again, you use paleontology and find out, oh, frogs are literally the only amphibian we know of in the entire fossil record to have a tadpole stage. Every other amphibian hatches out with legs, you know, suddenly you realize, oh, this isn't actually anything like this doesn't mean anything ultimately. It's, it's just, you know, kind of a um, maybe just a fluke, you know, that mm -hmm. these two things are related to each other. Um, 
so yeah, I think a lot of that stuff, it takes a long time to trickle down there. I mean, I, I, like I said, I don't know if it'll ever end up in the textbooks for like for high school or something. Um, you know, we have the same problem in actually in creation science in the church, um, that every year my students come in for essentials of geology, or I go speak at a church and I say, okay, how many of you believe, you know, and I'll say something like that. And, you know, uh, some, some kind of creationist idea and, you know, the huge majority of people raise their hands. And I'm like, I mean, did you know we dropped that in the nineties, like in creation science, you know, wow. but it just continues to get passed on in popular culture. Yeah. And this is one of the problems with, when we talk about science and society and how those things interact, you know, people try and blame scientists for something that happened. Well, you have to remember that like we publish stuff, then it goes to like popular news articles, right? Right. Sometimes they do a good job. Sometimes they don't. And then that gets carried on to, you know, schools or government, right? That's what they're reading. And they're trying to make policies based on that. And so by the time it actually gets to like a student or, you know, a random person, um, it's gone through several levels, you know, the telephone game, right? And yeah, so right. <laughs> many times you, you're you left with something very bizarre from what you actually started with. It's it's some, it's sad because we live in the information age now. I mean, <laughs> I, it wasn't hard to look up the original, the source article right. from wherever I was with my phone. You know, there it was. And we, we all have access to it. But I think maybe we've either lost the, the, the knowledge of how to get there, or maybe it's more the will to do it. You know, we'd rather, <laughs> let someone else translate this for me into, right. into a, into a soundbite that, that can be on the evening news in 30 seconds. And, yeah. uh, I mean, I, I read the, the, the popular article and then I read the abstract of the source article and there's no way that could be done in a 30 second soundbite. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. And, you know, I think this is a, this is a general problem we have now that, yeah, everyone assumed, oh, we'll make the internet, right. And it's going to be like this wonderful wealth of knowledge. And, and it is, but I mean, it's, you know, what are people using it for? I mean, it's, you know, mainly cat videos and stuff, right? Like it's, it's not actually, um, the the information is out there, but people don't know how to get it mm -hmm. or like you said, don't want to, you know, put through the effort. And also they don't know how to discern between what information is actually good and what is just, you know, garbage that's, that's floating around in there. And so that's just difficult. So as a, as a professor, how do you, how do you teach your students to be good at that process? It seems yeah, so important. It is really important. Um, and, you know, I, I think the biggest thing is stressing in the classroom you know, that ability to think, right, and reason and 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 trying to push those ideas on them that, you know, we're not just giving you a bunch of content to memorize. Because unfortunately, that's how most science classes are. When you talk about, you know, yeah. remember your own time growing up in school, it's like, oh, I just learned this set of facts. I know science, you know, <laughs> um, yep. but it's more, you know, it's, it's about the thinking process, right? That's yeah. what you want. Um, and so, you know, you're stressing that. But when it comes to, you know, research, um, I try to, in many classes, do a research component to it, you know, paper or presentation or something and tell them like, hey, here's how you look for sources, you know, and I'll put out these are particular ones to avoid because <laughs> this is bad. But if you don't know, it's going to look good. Right. Um, and there's some stuff out there like that. Um, but in the end of the day, you know, I still get people turning in papers or, you know, articles or, you know, like uh, presentations or things where they're they're referencing stuff that's just bad, you know, and yeah. it's it's going to get through. I mean, that's that's the world we live in with the Internet. So another, uh, uh, this is not really an aside, but it, I, I'm very curious now. I, I've, after looking at a picture of what a lamprey <laughs> is, is... Did you fall in love with it? Uh, is this something that shows up in people's aquariums as a, as a pet? <laughs> <laughs> um, I do not know of any. Um, so the challenge is... <clears throat> You've got all your living lampreys have that amosite stage. Most of them have to switch between fresh and salt water. So, I mean, you can't really do that with an aquarium tank very easily. Yeah. I guess you could catch like an adult one and just not, you know, have it breed. But um, you've got to find someone to feed them and they, they're parasitic. I wouldn't <laughs> put my hand in any body of water that, that I knew had one no. of those in it. I'll tell no. you right now. It looks like something out of H.G. Wells' book. It it's, does. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, what's... Um, the, the other lampreys that are alive today that aren't parasitic, they actually only live for a very short time as an adult because they, they don't eat at all. So they'll spend most of their lives as the amos eat and then just be an adult and breed and die. Um, but you know, it's funny you bring up like an HG Wells kind of look for these things because yeah. this is something I talk about in my classes a lot, um, that, you know, when you look at the actual design that's out there and especially when you get into the fossil record and you find all these just amazingly wild things you would never expect to exist, um, and then you try and watch like a sci-fi thing or a fantasy thing. And you realize like, wow, we are not all that creative <laughs> you know, compared to what God can do. I mean, oh, like wow. it's, it's, it's interesting, but like, you know, most of the time when you watch like a sci-fi movie or something, 
it's just versions of animals we already have. They're just modifying it slightly. Oh, they gave it six arms instead of two arms, you know, or things like that. And it's like, okay, I mean, that's cool, but it's it's nowhere near the actual design that's actually out there, you know? We were talking before we hit record about uh, that one of those shows you see on TV, River Monsters, right? Yep. You know, where some of, some of the things they they put in front of the camera I, are mind boggling to yes. me. Yes, yeah. Um, and I I have to conclude like you. Well, the, not only are we not that creative, but how creative is the Lord? Yes, uh, that that He constructed this thing here to do this. To, to perform this activity in this river, you know, it's, right. you know, we look at it, it's a monster because it has sharp teeth, but it actually is very important to the ecosystem here. Yep. Uh, that's just fascinating to me. Uh, you, you live in a very interesting world. Uh, yes. And and it's, I think what's most interesting is that it, like you said, it's always changing mm-hmm. that the, you know, and I know your foundation is not the science. Your foundation is the Bible that science is based on, but it must be fun when these discoveries take place and you go, oh, okay, that confirms what, I was, I've been waiting for this. Yeah. I didn't know it was going to come or what, where it was going to come from, but I knew it would get here. Yeah. And now I can't wait to bring it into the classroom and tell my students and then see where the, how the scientific community responds to this. Right. Um, very interesting. Well, Professor McLean, thank you so much for joining us today. This, is, this has been very enlightening uh, for me, especially as a, as a non-scientist, uh, to hear from someone who, who can put this in, in layman's terms. Um, and I, I look forward to our next conversation when the next discovery takes place. Sure. <laughs> Sounds good. Thanks All right. for having me. You got it. Thank you for listening to The Art of Discernment. For more information on the Masters University, visit masters.edu. You can also find us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. We'll see you next time.